Did God really command genocide? I mean, when we look at the scriptures, it seems pretty damning. Oh, wait, wait. Or is it? One thing's for sure, anyone who calls themselves a Christian has some really hard things to wrestle through. What about all those things that God did in the Old Testament? Did he really command the murder of whole countries, men, women, and children? That's why today I wanna shed some light on what the Bible really says and help you to know how to lean into a crisis of faith without losing your grip on faith. Today on Church Door. When I was a kid, I loved professional wrestling. Hulk Hogan, The Ultimate Warrior, The Undertaker, and Macho Man Randy Savage, oh yeah! And up until I was about age 12, I even dreamed that I would be in the WWE. I mean, I had every figure, I watched every show, and even had a wrestling ring constructed in my backyard for my 12th birthday. Dad? Oh, it's on! Rollin', buddy! Now, despite the fact that professional wrestling is a glorified soap opera for guys, the actual punishment these athletes put their body through is grueling. One well-known wrestler named Mick Foley, also known as Cactus Jack, Dude Love, or Mankind, was known for sustaining over 21 major injuries over the course of his wrestling career. Some of the highlights of this list include five broken ribs, a broken jaw, and two-thirds of his ear being ripped off. It's your ear. Now, any sane person looking at this injury list has to ask themselves, why would anyone subject themselves to such grueling pain? Now, I can't say why Mick Foley put his body through all of that stuff. I can say this, when it comes to our faith, we also have some wrestling to do. And oftentimes, at the back end of that wrestling, there is some hard things to come to grips with. Some people would call this having a crisis of faith. That's why today's message is called How to Lean into a Crisis of Faith Without Losing Your Grip on Faith. Within scripture, there are some really hard things to come to grips with, especially in light of our modern culture. When we read the stories of antiquity, their world seems so foreign to us and in many ways, barbaric. Yet the beauty of these scriptures is that we are forced to wrestle with our faith. Is this the God we truly serve? Or are we maybe missing something that we don't fully understand? Hmm. In Joshua chapter 6, we meet Israel, God's people, as they're awaiting to take their promised land. God commands them for the next seven days to march around this city called Jericho. For six days, seven priests who were holding the Ark of the Covenant and all Israel's men of war marched around the city once each day. Then on the seventh day, they did the same thing but seven times over, all in one day. And at the end of this march, they blasted their horns, all the warriors yelled out, Hear the roar! And the city's walls collapsed. Now. Nothing too complicated there. And actually, from a devotional perspective, it seems kind of great. When God calls us to do something, we follow him. And he always follows through on his promises. But what comes next in these scriptures gets kind of complicated. Here's what the scripture says. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel, bronze and iron, are holy to the Lord, and they shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. And soon as the people heard the sounds of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. 
so that the people went into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. Standing on the backside of God's long-awaited promise was destruction. In order for God's people to take the land, the people in it had to go somewhere. Now this is where our faith gets complicated. So was God commanding genocide? No, but what we do learn is that God takes sin seriously. The sin of the Canaanites was deserving of judgment and destruction. And believe me, there are lines of atheists like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, and Matt Delahunty that would all love you to believe that this was God's intent. But before you rush into line with them, let me share a few key points to fill in some blanks. These blanks often are missed when we read these verses in isolation. The people that lived in this land were not innocent people. Matter of fact, they were very far from it. We know from other scriptures and historical record that these people worshiped the god Molech. Yeah, well, so what, Ian? Here's why. We know that Molech worship included the central practice of child sacrifice. Their worship entailed a large bullheaded idol in which they built a huge fire underneath, and then they would place their children into the hands of that idol and watch them slowly burn to death. And if that was not enough, included in their worship practice was an array of lewd sexual practices of every type imaginable, including bestiality and incest. Therefore, God's judgment on the people in this land was not arbitrary. It was for their unrepentant, blatant, sinful practices. Not a Christian! And those practices permeated every fiber of their culture. And the people knew that this judgment was coming. It's demonstrated in the second chapter of Joshua, where Rahab says, there is terror and dread of you fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted in despair because of you. But according to Deuteronomy 20, they would have offered terms of peace, yet the people of Jericho and Canaan rejected these terms of peace. No! 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 The second thing we know is that these writings are ancient wartime texts, which contain hyperbolic language. What did he say? In other words, when you look at other similar texts from this time that had to do with war, they said the same type of things like, we completely destroyed our enemy. But is that the real truth? No, this was exaggerated language. Matter of fact, as you keep reading in Joshua, we see that indeed there are still Canaanite people left after these invasions. So what does this mean for us? I mean, the Old Testament paints a really physical and vivid picture of what our sin deserves. But the New Testament tells us how God himself comes to solve this very problem. And how did he do this? He did it by putting on flesh, coming to live among us, yet without sin, and then he went to a cross. He died on that cross, taking the wrath of our sin upon himself and then rising in three days later to show his power over that very sin. The Bible tells us that if we turn from our sin and we believe that Jesus was the sacrifice for our sins, in eternity, when we stand before God after everything's over, God will look at us and say, you are justified because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That means that God will not see our sin, he will see Jesus who took our wrath for our sins and ultimately conquered over it. The question I have for you is, have you submitted your whole life to Jesus? If you've never done that, and today you wanna to find forgiveness from your sin, we have a team of people here that would love to walk you through that process. Reach out to us in the comments or text prayer to the number that you see coming up on the screen. Hey, help us promote great Christian content by hitting that subscribe button and the notification bell so that every single time we put out a piece of content, it'll come directly to you. Or you can go the extra mile by going to rivervalleyrockford.org slash give and making a donation there. Every single cent that we receive goes right back into helping people just like you 
take their next step with Jesus. Our prayer for you this week is that you would wrestle with the things of God. You would ask yourself, have I truly and fully submitted myself to him? And that when you do, that you would come out knowing that he is the one who forgives you of your sin. Our time doesn't have to stop here. We've actually been doing a series in the book of Joshua. So go ahead and click that button in the center of the screen and you can watch last week's part of this series, Vision to Victory.